think it's 1252 let's go ahead and start this session so yeah hello everyone and welcome to the dev Con conference we and i'm human uh, representing red hat and yeah welcome back from the short break sessions and right now we would be taking over the data gateways the legacy data for services session and we have with us the huge giroru uh, who would be taking us this session oh, for around half an hour and we would be having a live Q&A after the session is getting completed. So yeah, welcome again and yeah. Hi, hello. Uh, welcome to this session. My name is Hugo Guerrero and uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, data gateways and how to bridge between legacy data and monolithic databases and a microservice architecture. So. I hope you enjoyed the following minutes. Um, thank you very much for joining and let's get started. So we will be covering in, uh, in a couple of topics in, in, in the agenda for this session. We will be talking about the architecture evolution and how applications has been, have been, um, been changing in the way that they are um, uh, using their components and how they're uh, handling the uh, cloud native nature of uh, distributed systems. Also, we will be talking about microservices data and, and what was the problem that the API gateway solved when they started to rise in a few years ago, as well as uh, how to handle uh, how to handle data under the microservices uh, uh, pardon and the architecture that it's uh, it's uh, focuses on. On microservices. As well, we will be talking uh, at the end about the data gateways capabilities, how they're um, working, and what is the idea behind having a, a data gateway, as well as some of the types that are currently available. And finally, we'll be talking about different um, open source data gateways, uh, what options do we have available, and we will be focusing on one specific one that it's uh, called TIP, and it's a, a project that is sponsored by, by Red Hat. So I introduce myself. Uh, my name is Hugo. I'm a uh, Mexican. It's currently covering in, uh, in a couple of topics in, in, in the agenda for this session. We will be talking about the architecture evolution and how applications has been have been um, been changing in the way that they are um, uh, using their components and how they are uh, handling the uh, cloud native nature of uh, distributed systems. Also, we will be talking about microservices data and, and what was the problem that the API gateway solved when they start to rise in a few years ago, as well as uh, how to handle uh, how to handle data under the microservices uh, uh, piling and the architecture that it's uh, it's uh, focuses on on microservices. As well, we will be talking uh, at the end about the data gateway capabilities how they're um, working and what is the idea behind having a, a data gateway as well as some of the types that are currently available. And finally, we'll be talking about different um, open source data gateways, uh, what options do we have available, and we will be focusing on one specific one that it's uh, called TEETH and it's a, a project that is sponsored by, by Red Hat. So I introduce myself, uh, my name is Hugo, I'm, a, I'm a Mexican, and it's currently based in the uh, Boston area. In, in Massachusetts here in the United States. I'm currently working with Red Hat as an API and, and messaging or even driven specialist. I'm also uh, have been an open source um, uh, advocate since uh, since I first started working with uh, with the, the JBoss uh, enterprise application server around uh, 2004. So it, it has been a long journey uh, working with open source software. I'm also a history and travel enthusiast. So I, I really uh, enjoy uh, traveling as well as um, this new uh, new food and, and, and new uh, 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 snacks or, or street food around around the world. So here's my uh, Twitter handler. If you want to follow the conversation, you are welcome to just follow or, or tweet or uh, continue to um, uh, post more information on on, on these topics. So uh, we were talking about the, what is uh, what is the evolution that applications have been um, coming around uh, since we start moving away from the uh, traditional um, type of architecture of three layers, one single application, one single deployment, or multiple uh, deployment files, but just running the same 
uh, infrastructure. So first we start with the 12 factor applications. We start to decouple certain characteristics and, and part of the design of your application, moving away from uh, high coded configurations to externalize ways to uh, do injection, as well as uh, keeping different um, uh, uh, source repositories to have different paths and way to handle our applications. Obviously that lets us, us to uh, microservices architecture with the uh, with all the benefits of having uh, these cloud resources that looks like they're infinite and allows uh, us to have uh, several deployments of our applications in different locations, um, just uh, asking or requesting uh, resources to a cloud provider or in a cloud feature. And finally, the next uh, step on, 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 on this kind of evolution is what is coming right now on, on the topic of serverless as well as um, function as a service, right? The serverless being the capability of having all these microservices or containers or functions being able to scale to zero and just being called, just being activated while being idle when there's an event or when there's a call or request that it's addressed to that specific um, service container or function and then it, it gets started, it do all the uh, the processing that is required and then scale back to zero. Also there's, you know, this part of this, this change and, and, and this focus on having uh, also function as a service as a synonymous of, of serverless, but um, that's a specific way of how to handle the code and the packaging and who's actually managing uh, those kind of components. But obviously they get the benefit of having this option of scale to zero um, as part of the uh, of the function as a service uh, infrastructure. So this is how we have been moving away from um, from the traditional one single block of uh, of code in, in one single deployment as, as an application. However, this has been uh, only a trend or a change at the uh, processing network layer because most of the times this kind of development, this kind of microservices and serverless and functions. Most of them are um, very dynamic. That's the way they require uh, the scalability, this portability. But sometimes we are actually getting um, away from the from the static nature of uh, one of the components of the architecture that we cannot uh, neglect, and and that is data. So most of the times you perhaps have been. Um, facing these kind of problems uh, when, when dealing with your application, right? So you have your this beautiful microservices architecture that it's pristine and, and it's ideal and it's ready to be deployed. However, you have behind you this monolithic database, this single source of data that it has not been refactored, has been not um, uh, work around to make it work with your microservices architecture. So you think you're already there, is you think you have already saved your just a few moments uh, of crossing the uh, the finish line. However, there's this big monster behind you that is just waiting for you to be distracted to you know um, take that uh, that stuff on your on your back. So um, I am totally sure you have seen this uh, this kind of a scenario before when. Um, you have microservices that are actually um, sharing at the same at some, uh, database or are being dragged back by the uh, limitations on on how the uh, how the services um, uh, are limited on, on, on and couple in, in the same same moment when they're uh, sharing data with other services. So what can we do? Uh, well, we have seen that the traditional architecture has, some challenges also benefits um, when you have all these three layers all together, but they're actually accessing just one single data source or one single uh, type of storage. Um, you certainly have uh, some consistency, right? All the logic is in the same language, all the, uh, all the access to the database, most of the times goes to one single storage. So, it's something that it, it's uh, going to be there forever. When we take a decision around the storage, it's, it's going to be, um, we're going to be uh, using that storage for, for a long time. So um, there's uh, obviously the challenges of uh, how frequently you're going to release, 
if you make change in one of the layers, you certainly will need to be sure that the uh, that change does not affect the rest of the of the architecture and how to make these um, uh, resource isolations if you want to focus on, on problems in a specific component of your architecture. Well, those are the things that we are trying to get a, a, away from. So that's why we have um, this distributed architecture and, and there's there's new challenges that we need to deal with when you were switching from the uh, previous monolithic uh, type of deformance traditional architecture to the distributed one. So the first has to do with um, microservices being um, a distributed system, uh, a system that it's not running in one single place, but it's uh, it needs to be um, uh, deployed across different um, resources called it could be servers or it could be uh, different clouds even and and that makes uh, communication between those services critical and vital because we we need to we need to face this there's no service that lives in the vacuum and that it can uh, exist uh, alone so most of the time your services your microservices will to connect to uh, communicate or, or have this kind of connectivity between them or with other services so that's where that's why we still uh, see some challenges on this kind of architecture. But now they're moving from these um, uh, previous amount of challenges to two kind of challenges, to new challenges. So the first ones uh, are related to the networking. You know, we mentioned that we are at, uh, having a distributed architecture that needs to communicate, right? It needs to connect. So that's the, the network challenge where you need to know um, where are your services deployed, so you need to do discovery. You need to balance the load between the call to your services and what happens when suddenly one of your services that is not um, available and uh, how do you um, share the information you can use uh, just simple connectivity or you can just a uh, call of services directly or you can use something like uh, like apis to have a better governance of your of your communication and obviously monitoring and tracing to know what is happening in, in your communication layer the second type of challenge that you get when you're talking about distributed architecture goes in the uh, data layer. So we talk about when, when we're seeing um, uh, this monster behind you, that the data access uh, also becomes challenged when we're talking about uh, microservices. Why? Because there's this um, focus on having these decoupled services that can be also um, managing independently and the idea is obviously to have a, each one of those microservices being able to just own one of the one of the storage and being able to manage that, you know, take property of, of that kind of storage. So you still need to be able to share that information, share that data between your services, right? Uh, if you have a customer that is doing orders and you have, want to have the items and the payments, you need to communicate with all, all these systems and share that information. So you will certainly need to have this kind of abstraction layer to be able to um, move that data in a, in, in a simple way between all these different services. Also, you want to have the services available in um, in different points of your of your system. You also want to handle them uh, in a in a homogeneous way where you can communicate them in easily and everybody is able to understand them. So those are the kind of challenges that you can face uh, where doing a, a distributed architecture like doing microservices. So uh, when we were talking about the uh, network uh, challenge, one of the things that uh, we uh, came uh, on idea when we discovered that we need to have to um, handle this kind of network connectivity and way to connect your services is the race of, a of API gateways, right? So when the uh, suddenly the load balancer is just not enough for having a um, system that it's um, that is a security um, device that it's in the perimeter of your application or your network that is just uh, uh, shielding you from from outside, uh, that's suddenly not enough. We need, you need to take more decisions on how to apply certain controls, certain governance on the way you share information between your systems. And, and how your applications suddenly start to consume those services. So this is how the gateway helps us to um, configure this type of access into this new layer. So 
the API gateway first gives us an abstraction layer where you don't need to know exactly where, what system needs to answer to, which, uh, to what uh, request. You can also apply in a single point of access certain policies, uh, for example, uh, access control or rate limiting or even uh, adding some security layer uh, that perhaps you don't actually need to uh, do or implement in each one of your services. When you're um, taking your applications to access through the gateway, you are able to um, have this point to be able to enforce those policies. And then because you are actually now in the trusted zone uh, of the network or, or your application, and you're able to call those services and the gateway has the uh, enough intelligence to know which service needs to um, solve or, or access one of those, re of those requests. So uh, in the in the data in the data layer or in the uh, data type of challenges, um, as we mentioned, uh, when we're talking about microservice, we're talking about that we have services that require an independent database per each one of those services, because this will help us to you know um, tackle that problem with the coupling. Uh, if we have a shared storage and we have services working on the exact same storage. Uh, store of, of data, uh, and we, we change one, uh, obviously it's gonna, it's gonna hit or it's gonna uh, pass some, um, some additional problems to the other system. So the idea behind the, how microservices should uh, address data, you know, each one having their own, their own database. And by owning this database, it, it could mean two different things, right? The first one is, you know, be literal and have two different instances of database totally independent each one from another, right? So we have an instance running one server um, as, as for microservices A, or having a second instance with um, with the data and, and the access just for microservices B. The other option to uh, have this kind of independent data is just you know having the exact same instance, but having this um, uh, separation between uh, schemas, if, if the database is able to handle the schemas, or grouping of tables, right? So uh, a set of tables are owned by one microservice and the only way to communicate to, to that uh, or to manage or access that data is through that service that it's owning that information and other service uh, being able to have the information from the uh, from the other perspective and just accessing their own uh, their own tables. So there's different ways to, to handle that. Uh, it depends on how, how really you want them to be independent. Uh, but the focus is that just one microservices owns the data. You are not sharing that information at, at, at the uh, at start level. Um, the second thing that uh, the microservices uh, tend to um, enforce or, or shape the, the way we handle data is um, the uh, heterogeneity of the uh, of the services, right? So. Most of the times when we start to uh, build or develop our services in specific languages or different languages and different tooling, uh, also it represents that um, we certainly will finish, will end with a different um, persistent ledger for, uh, for each one of those services. Because actually the data is different, you know? Um, there's data that needs to be treated differently and also it needs to be stored in a different way. So it's 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 over those times where we can put the data in one single type of store just to make it uh, uh, make it uh, compatible with the rest of, of, of the data available. So in this case, we will certainly will need to have a, a type of information and data that needs to be stored in a relational database where we need to have high consistency data, or perhaps we will need to store that information in a document uh, that database type or you will be able to uh, access that uh, um, easily and you will be able to have um, a more um, flexible way to store that information. Or even sometimes you will need to do just a um, in-memory type of key value type of storage for your information because that is different. Microservices allow us to have this kind of, uh, of difference between how to handle data and that obviously represents a challenge when you need to deal with this uh, polyglot uh, persistence uh, persistence layer.
So as we can see, we have uh, different uh, type of uh, solutions, um, but in, in kind of a similar way addressing the, uh, the challenges we mentioned before. So in the one side, we have the API gateway where uh, we can have this implementation uh, uh, and the abstraction of, of the communication with services uh, where we are focusing on, um, on a contract through API first design and development, and it's in charge of the load balancing and the network resiliency on how to access our services and allows you to uh, implement certain access control on how your applications are calling the, uh, the microservices. So in a certain way, we will have something similar when we're talking about data gateways, right? So we still want to have this abstraction layer on top of the implementation details on the data store. And also we want to have this type of a federated approach where we can access and address data in, in the exact same way, independently of how it's stored, right? From the application perspective, I just don't want to deal with the all these implementation details of how the uh, database is being, um, is being managed and how it's implemented. Um, also allows us to, you know, uh, boost the performance when suddenly we need to scale, allowing us to have this type of data gateways can help us to um, uh, being able to implement um, uh, some policies or some mechanisms like caching or materialized views uh, to allow us to, you know, have more, uh, uh, as services or more applications being able to access that data, but perhaps it's been um, it's been kept on, on infrastructure that perhaps is not able to scale. Saying we're targeting a very old database or perhaps a mainframe that cannot scale beyond the uh, the current um, infrastructure. So basically, the a data gateway is just like an API gateway. But in, instead of you know focusing on how to access the network layer to just reach the microservices that you want to do and being able to talk with that services under the same uh, circumstances, it focuses on the um, data layer implementation and and it's being able to actually access the uh, data uh, implementation details and being able to connect and um, talk to the a specific uh, implementation uh, resource and then being able to offer that uh, information or that data in an homogeneous way to any one of those uh, consumers. So that's basically how data gateways as a resemble the API gateways. So what are these uh, data gateways capabilities that we're talking about? Well, we mentioned a couple of them in, in, in the previous slide, right? We actually were looking for a, a piece of software that can do this abstraction layer that can help us do the decoupling between the service that it's calling the data and how is the actual uh, data store being implemented. So it has these implementation details. I just don't need to know if the data is coming from a uh, um, document database or in-memory database or even an API service. I, I can just access it in the exact same way. So. It um, hides implementation and abstracts the physical source of the information. Or also allows us to add this uh, security layer where we can um, take uh, some uh, control on the access of the data through the modeling of the actual data. So instead of thinking about uh, just um, accessing resources like we do in the, in the API gateway, we can focus then on, on implementing some policies around specifics uh, on the data, like for example, row or table level. So you're able to have a more um, fine grained control of the database without having to implement all those policies, all that information in the actual database. So you will have this uh, layer or an, at, at the data gateway level where you can implement all these policies without needing to go to the actual implementation. And obviously this, uh, uh, with, with the mechanisms like caching and materials use, you are able to scale your uh, your um, your infrastructure to be able to handle more loads, right? Instead of, you know, hitting a mainframe that perhaps it's limited in, in, in capacity, uh, you can just uh, do it once, then you know, populate the cache, and in, then it's been used to um, to uh, return all the responses or, or the responses that are being uh, requested to, to that data gateway. 
And with the uh, usage of uh, some other um, components, like for example, or, or patterns through tools like uh, Change Data Capture, for example, through the Desium, you're able to, well, being able to uh, invalidate the cache or just update the caching when suddenly there's a, a, an update on, on, on the versus layer and you're able to um, continue to have these uh, scalability um, features on, on your gateway. Uh, we talk about the federation and being able to access the data in a single way, even though the implementation details are different on the different sources. And one of the approach that is uh, very useful for applications is to you know keep a very known language and how to uh, how to query the information um, that can be uh, very useful to try to keep it the, uh, the schema first or the design of the contract through um, standards like like SQL. So um, we have talked about the different capabilities of, of the data gateway. And now let's go over some of these um, examples of what data is, because um, there's no one single solution. There are different shades of data gateways um, going from, for example, the classic data virtualization layer, where you can find um, solutions like um, a Composite or Denodo, where they still have like the same um, centralized um, single deployment approach that we used to have um, in the ESB, uh, when we were talking about networking or, or SOA, for example, to do this kind of virtualization where everything goes under the same um, infrastructure. Or you can have also um, the federation within the database where you can uh, have these um, databases like Postgres that can implement some kind of uh, engines that allow you to um, offer access to the, to the, uh, to the details of the uh, database through um, standardized uh, uh, connectors. Uh, there's also a, a rise on, on, on the use of uh, graph, uh, GraphQL bridges to be able to access uh, um, uh, data sources in a simple unified way. So this is, it's pretty common to be found in uh, mobile devices or um, front-end applications that uh, need to do several um, movements or several uh, changes in the, in the data store at the same time. And so using a, a bridge like GraphQL allows you to apply all these different type of, uh, of changes on a single store. There's also uh, things like cloud hosted uh, data gateways, like for example, um, AWS Athena has uh, some examples. There's um, AWS Rift, uh, Redshift uh, where you can have a, a single access to a data store that can be backed by um, S3 buckets or other different type of components that are more proprietary to the cloud provider, but still you can have a single point of access that it's um, been able to serve you through standards like, like uh, SQL and, and, and others. And there's uh, other ways where you can uh, rely more on the network level and have this kind of uh, data proxies that are just doing uh, secure tunneling to access the, uh, the 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 backend services. So you can use something like Google's Cloud SQL proxy, or even uh, there's a a project based on uh, on the QP dispatch router called Scoper that allows you to access certain um, certain resources on your network, certain services like in your Kubernetes cluster, uh, going through a proxy that can apply certain policies and then able to let you um, forward the uh, the connection to your to your actual database. But you are missing some of the capabilities that we talk about. Um, uh, we got, we, what we are expecting in the data gateways in the past. And finally, there's uh, some open source data gateways that are also available um, out there. So um, Apache Drill is one of the projects that has this schema free. SQL query engine for no SQL databases. There's uh, other solutions like Presto. The project started by Facebook that allows you to have this um, engine being targeting mainly big data uh, use cases, but still something that, that it's open source and it's available in the field. And finally, there's um, a project that it's sponsored by, by Red Hat, as, as mentioned at the beginning, that's called Teeth. Teeth is a um, it's a project that has been around for, for a while, but currently is now uh, being focused on being able to deploy this kind of gateways at a Kubernetes native level. 
When uh, talking about uh, TEED, so TEED has uh, different components. Um, the new the new focus or the new report of, of this project is to be able to have uh, uh, based on the operator pattern, the Kubernetes operator is mainly focusing on, on, on Kubernetes to be able to deploy these gateways as microservices that act um, through connectors to be able to you know connect uh, and, and establish the communication with the uh, data source. They have different type of connectors to different type of uh, of of, uh, of data stores that can talk to relational databases, non-relational databases, APIs, or even object storage, and then um, can uh, connect or interact with um, policy uh, policy uh, control pl uh, control planes where you can define things like um, the type of um, security that you want to apply, the role access control. And then expose that information through different uh, type of it, where you can uh, just use a or implement or start a, a JDBC um, endpoint or driver where you can connect with with the with the JDBC driver and being able to create information using traditional and CSQL, or you can access that information through a REST endpoint or um, for um, other applications that perhaps require different type of access, there's um, an endpoint that could be used through ODBC. So you can have different ways to uh, interact with the gateway in, in a way that most of the applications are ready to do, and then apply the policies as part of the, the gateway pattern, and then being able to access the, the data store. So this is a way where um, people uh, like data engineers can design the access to their um, to their data, to, data uh, pipelines or data lakes or, or data ponds where they've been able to uh, share that information in a secure, abstract, uh, and, and homogeneous way to other applications. So just to finish, uh, this is a, it's a great comment from, from uh, a, a, a colleague of us in, in Red Hat, uh, Bill Ingram, that he is um, having this, this part of, as part of the uh, of the article he wrote about uh, data gateways. So data has gravity, also requires uh, control. Uh, it's hard to scale if you are using the traditional approach, obviously. And it's it's sometimes difficult to uh, move between uh, cloud infrastructure. So the data gateway is one of the components that it makes even more clear that we need to have this kind of, uh, of components to be able to deploy um, not just in as one single way, not just in one in data center or just in the cloud, but it's in is the requirement of this kind of components at the uh, hybrid cloud level that actually uh, it's becoming a necessity. And the data gateways is it's a, a way it is a pattern uh, that you can use to uh, be able to overcome the problems and the challenges of the uh, data layer, as we did with the API gateways at the network level. So I really appreciate these moments with with me. Uh, I hope you like this session. Um, it has um, just a brief information on how uh, data gateways work, what are we expecting on the capabilities. And there is different uh, projects that we are um, we are following on how to implement uh, this kind of, of uh, uh, software components. You have some examples there. If you want to take a look, uh, visit the, uh, the TEAT project. It's uh, something that are still uh, working and they're still updating on, on the different options. You can see some examples in their data page, in, in their uh, website. So um, I hope you like this session. I really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to be with you. And um, thank you very much. See you, bye. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Hugo, for the uh, lightning talk on the topic. And yeah, we are open for the Q and A sessions. If anyone has any questions for about the session or about the microservices, they can just pop in uh, in the chat box. I think Hugo, you had a pretty exciting session. And I don't see any of the questions lying in the chat box. So yeah, we'll be ending out this session right now and yeah, we'll